Hello friends, I'm Shobha Shukla from CNS and our honored guests for today's conversation are Dr. Kono Tweed and Jessica Wiggs. Dr. Tweed is an honorary clinical lecturer at the Medical Research Council Clinic Trials Unit at University College London. And Jessica is Senior Communication Specialist at TB Alliance. We will be hearing from them the latest exciting news about the all oral BPAL regimen as it is called, comprising bedaquiline, pretominate, and linozolate, which has been developed by TB Alliance to treat pulmonary drug-resistant tuberculosis. It not only reduces the treatment time to six months, but also increases the treatment success rate to over 90%. So a very warm welcome to you both. And uh, we will begin with Connor. Connor, can you please share the highlights of the Xenix phase three study as well as the Nix TB study? And also, what was your involvement with these two studies? So, well, obviously, just first of all, a big, a big thank you for, for letting us come on and, and discuss these two studies, primarily the Xenix study, obviously. Um, so basically the the, Z the Xenex study is the most recent publication by the sponsored by the TB Alliance to, to come into the New England Journal, looking at the effect of, as you said, this all oral regimen in highly drug resistant TB. To begin with, this, this, this all started more with the Nix study, which was published in the New England Journal in 2020. Again, with the TB Alliance's sponsor and with and in close collaboration with the MRC Clinical Trials Unit at UCL. This investigated the use of bedaquiline, protominid, and linazolid at a fixed dose of 1,200 milligrams per day, so two 600 milligram tablets per day, used to treat highly drug resistant tuberculosis. Highly drug resistant tuberculosis in this case was defined as. as tuberculosis that is resistant to aminoglycosides and fluoroquinolones or multidrug resistant tuberculosis that had where the patient was intolerant to treatment or not responding or finally pre-XDR tuberculosis wherein the patient is, is resistant to either a fluoroquinolone or an aminoglycoside with multidrug resistant TB. This trial, the next TB trial, found that there were, there were cure rates reached for 90% um, of the patients enrolled. Out of 109 patients, 90% had a, had a favorable outcome on, after six months of oral, all oral treatment with these three drugs. However, this came at the cost with very high rates of toxicity. In particular, in the original Nix trial, um, it was 81% of patients who had one or more episodes of peripheral neuropathy that required the, the regimen to be either dose adjusted, interrupted, or abandoned altogether. And 48% of participants experienced one or more episode of myelosuppression, so a reduction in hemoglobin, white cells, or platelets. So based on the extremely, extremely favorable efficacy findings, and the fact that the BPAL regimen had been granted a, a limited license for use in, for use in a highly drug resistant TB. The, the Alliance set about designing a trial with UCL to explore the, the effect of different doses of linazolid to see if a balance could be reached whereby efficacy is maintained at the, the very high level scene of around about 90% in the next trial, but also reducing the toxicity to make the regimen more tolerable and more deliverable in programmatic settings. So with Xenix, there were four treatment arms. One of the treatment arms resembled the Nix arm, which was 1,200 milligrams of, of uh, linazolid as part of BPAL for six months. The second arm was 1,200 milligrams of linazolid given, with, given as part of BPAL but the linazolid was only delivered for two of the six months. The third treatment arm was again six months total, BPAL, with 600 milligrams of linazolid given for six months. And finally, 
there was a six month treatment arm of BPAL with the lacelid given at 600 milligrams for just two months. Now, the, obviously the, the treatment arms can get quite complicated and difficult to describe because there are four of them and they're all very, they are all quite, quite similar in composition and they really, they differ only in terms of the dose and duration of linazolid. The overall efficacy ranged between 93% favorable outcomes and so 93% cure in highly drug resistant tuberculosis down to 84% with 1,200 milligrams of, of um, linazolid given for six months, having the highest efficacy, and 600 milligrams of linazolid given for two months, having the, the lowest efficacy in that range. Most, most encouragingly, however, we saw that the, six, the, the treatment arm that contained six months of 600 milligrams of linazolid had 91% efficacy, so similar efficacy to the to the NYX regimen um, but massive but drastically reduced levels of toxicity so peripheral neuropathy was seen in only 24 percent of patients and myelosuppression occurred in only two percent of patients that, had, that received that that regimen so I suppose in summary what we've seen is that 181 partic participants were enrolled into Xenex with highly drug resistant TB, a form of TB that previously required 20 to 24 months to treat with associated cure rates between 40 to 50% in the field and high rates of toxicity. And we've, we've demonstrated 91% efficacy for a six month all oral regimen with only 24% of, of participants experiencing peripheral neuropathy and 2% experiencing myelosuppression while on treatment. Obviously there are there is still there is still work work to be done and conversations and evaluation with regulators is is ongoing but already this this regimen has been has been discussed discussed by the WHO and formed part of a recent rapid communication re-evaluating the treatment of, of drug-resistant TB. It doesn't, it may not represent the, the final answer to the problem of highly drug-resistant tuberculosis, but we would, we would submit, the TB Alliance and the MRC Clinical Trials Unit at UCL would submit that it does represent a significant and important step forwards in treating this disease. Uh, thank you very much for explaining that so clearly. But uh, uh, Conor, I had one question uh, when I was just reading uh, the study uh, that is regarding myelosuppression amongst those who got linozolid 600 mg for two months. Uh, amongst them, 7% show decline in their hemoglobin levels versus 2% among those who got the same dose for six months. So... Um... Yeah, with the with the myelosuppression, um, the I think the the figure you're quoting is the the neutrophil count mm -hmm. um, rather than than the hemoglobin, mm -hmm. um, wherein the the neutrophil count fell below 750 cells per millimeter cubed for one participant receiving 600 milligrams for for six months, which was um, the two percent and three participants receiving 600 milligrams for two months, which was the, the 7%. In terms of hemoglobin, um, we actually didn't see any significant hemoglobin episode, episodes of hemoglobin suppression on either of the 600 milligram treatment arms, but we did see um, nine participants, so 20% of those randomized to receive the 1,200 milligram dose for six months. Um, demonstrating a, a drop in their hemoglobin to less than 25% below baseline. I was muted. There could have been some other reasons for that also besides the linozolid dose or no, for this suppression. Yeah, so I suppose one of the, 
one of the pro one of the one of the um cautions with a trial that has a a small a smaller number recruited overall mm -hmm. is that obviously small numbers of participants experiencing an experiencing an event can translate into a large proportion so in this case nine participants represents 20 percent of the of the participants on that treatment arm um i mean i think we would be we i don't think we feel we feel comfortable to make a definitive causal statement about the relationship between the uh, the different doses of linazolid and the incidence of toxicity but i think we would we would feel confident to draw attention to the association between higher rates of toxicity with the higher doses of linazolid and lower or in the case of the hemoglobin non-existent toxicity toxicity events with the lower doses of linazolid sorry Shoba, i think you're um, muted again sorry oh, sorry sorry for that uh, in the Zenic study, there were 181 participants, out of which 36 were HIV positive, 20% of them. So in the randomization process, were there HIV positive participants in all the four arms? And were there any significant differences in the endpoint outcomes in them as compared to the HIV negative participants? Yeah, so I think I would I would um, answer the first your first yes. question first, which is that there was a a um, I think it was actually sorry I was taking yeah so it was equal numbers equal numbers on each of the treatment arms were HIV positive so nine participants on each treatment arm which was between forty five to forty six participants per arm were HIV positive. Um, I think I would, I personally would be very cautious about using the word significant in this context. Um, again, that's, that is a, that is quite a small number of patients um, and perhaps could be, could be, could be a limitation to the, to the study actually that that small number of HIV patients were enrolled. Um, but again, it would, it would translate into small numbers of participants having events or favorable versus favorable outcomes with quite large proportion numbers associated with that, which would be, I think, misleading. Additionally, I think it's important to remember that there was, there was no control arm in this trial. Um, instead, efficacy was, was measured against this 50% cutoff that was was frankly was frankly decided in an era before the the next TB results had come out, and really in an era where, actually, I mean, as late as as recent as 2017, 2018, to achieve 50% success rate with this highly drug resistant TB would have been considered quite a significant jump forwards. So we 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 more tested the arms not against a control. Um, but rather against this this fifty percent efficacy rating. Yes, I, that's a very big jump in the treatment success rate. In, indeed, that's a big jump from that fifty percent to uh, ninety percent, almost ninety above eighty percent in all the four arms, and uh, above ninety percent in the arm which you found best suited. So, do you think that uh, there is a need to replicate this study elsewhere? With larger number of participants, including more HIV positive participants, uh, or is this evidence conclusive enough? So I think the 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 big challenge to to replicating this study with with larger numbers is that we are while we're talking about a significant disease in terms of its driver behind the the tbf the global tb epidemic it's i think unacceptable for people to die from a from an infection that could theoretically be treated nonetheless in terms of absolute numbers of patients who have this kind of resistant tuberculosis globally the number is not that great and so recruiting a study with larger numbers that would be adequately powered to detect significant treatment effects amongst subgroups like that, I think would be practically very challenging. 
Um, obviously, the, the scientist in me always wants more data and bigger trials, but I think at this point, we've got, we do have very, very good, well, as, I think as good evidence as we could manage to have that points towards, I mean, very good efficacy with this regimen. Okay, and uh, I think that is why uh, there is there have been re many regulatory authorities have uh, actually endorsed this uh, treatment. So FDA mm -hmm. and the European Medicine Authority and even WHO. Uh, it a uh, WHO I think has uh, approved it under uh, uh, operational research. Um, uh, if if I am not wrong, uh, I can jump in there. That's absolutely yes, correct. Yes. Thank yes. you. Yeah. Um, the WHO released a rapid communication earlier this year in May um, saying that it'll be used uh, BPAL and BPALM under operational research. So a lot of countries are already getting ready to use that once the guidelines are actually released. Okay. And also, I think Ukraine has started it under the operational research program. Yes. Yeah. The Earlier this year, they were the first country to operationalize it. Okay. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, Connor, uh, what about, means I'm just curious to know about uh, extra pulmonary drug resistant tuberculosis there, uh, uh, because uh, this regimen is for the pulmonary TB. So mm -hmm. any hopes for the extra pulmonary uh, TB patients? So I suppose the, the, the translation of pulmonary TB research into the extra pulmonary population is is often left to the discretion of the of the clinician or the program that's deciding on on national tb tb treatment policy i mean the to me the the considerations for translating it translating a regimen like this or any novel tb regimen into into extra pulmonary tb is that first of all pulmonary tb is generally chosen in clinical trials really for for sake of ease it's easier to to diagnose it's easier to monitor and it's easier to confirm cure with pulmonary tb as well as that prevalence i mean 75 percent of cases will be pulmonary tb however with with extra pulmonary tb um a kind of i suppose a kind of reassuring or intuitively reassuring um way to look at it is that extra pulmonary TB is generally more policy bacillary, and therefore you would imagine easier to treat than, than pulmonary TB. A caution is that extra pulmonary TB is more common amongst the HIV positive population. So you need to think about things like immunocompromise, paradoxical reactions, and drug-drug interactions with any, any novel regimen. Um, but it's, it's not really, extra pulmonary TB isn't really something that lends itself, unfortunately, doesn't lend itself that easily to, to clinical research. Just because, as I said, it's harder to diagnose, harder to monitor, and harder to tell when, when someone is, is cured or not. Um, it's difficult for me to make any recommendations, but I think, I think most, most practicing TB clinicians would, would probably feel comfortable translating this across to, to an extra pulmonary environment, to an extra pulmonary disease site. But that would have to be, that would have to be their decision and the decision of any, any national treatment programs. Yeah, rightly so. Meanwhile, uh, what do you think should this, uh, this regimen uh, not be, should it not be available as first line therapy for all drug resistant tuberculosis cases? Yeah, so that's a that's the big that's the big question, isn't it? Um, I think I mean what I would what I would say is that we we do not want to we do not want to repeat the mistakes of the past with these with these novel regimens. Um, you know, whenever whenever the original first line first line drugs were invented and ratified as a regimen in the sort of 19, 1980s, um, everyone was very excited. TB treatment had gone from, once again, 20, 24 months, down to nine, down to six, and it was, it was a cause for celebration. Um, however, 
I think perhaps perhaps difficulty in supplying drugs, difficulty in diagnosing drug resistance early and things like that, numerous factors all came together to to create, to contribute to this, this burden of drug resistant TB that we have to face now. Um, I think that ultimately the, the goal with any of these novel regimens is first of all, to have probably several available, which can be tailored to the drug resistance profile that is rapidly identified for any drug resistant TB cases. So it's really a question, I don't think it's a question of taking a new regimen and dropping it into an environment and hoping that it will solve all the problems. I think that it has to be part of consideration around infrastructure, availability of diagnostics and funding for TB programs. Regardless, I, I do think that this regimen and BPAM, the, the regimen in TB practical with moxifloxacin added, both represent very important steps forward. Yes, I think you're right. And one has to tread with caution because, and also I believe some bedaculin resistance has already been uh, uh, recorded in, in Africa, South Africa, I believe, or somewhere. Yeah. So, so one has to be careful not to, so that we do not lose the drugs which are effective right now because of the resistance being developed. Right. Yes. Uh, anything else you would like to add, Conor, which might have missed? which I might have missed, and also your closing remarks on national TV programs and translating scientific breakthroughs into public health outcomes quickly without any avoidable delays. If I, if I, can, if I can come up with an answer for that last one, then I would be, I would be, very, I would be much smarter than I really am. But I think, um, I mean, I think, I think what I would say, what I would say in closing, first, the first thing I would do is just really kind of summarize that what we're, what we've shown with, with Xenix is that, first of all, this dosing linazolid at 600 milligrams for six months, as part of the BPAL regimen, so bedaquiline, protominid, and linazolid, does seem to represent a regimen that has certainly very, very high efficacy from what we've seen in the trial context and a favorable safety profile, which again would suggest that it is it is a suitable regimen to, to be used in programmatic real world settings. However, I think that, you know, we have, we have touched on the facts that there is no such thing as a magic bullet in dealing with, with drug resistant TB. And any novel regimen has to be taken, taken with the perspective of programmatic adjustments or what are needed. So as you said, there needs to be, there needs to be a, a big increase in funding into, into TB programs in the most hard hit areas. We need to see an improvement in diagnostics, not just in the technology, but in the rollout of, the, of this technology. We need to see better awareness and we do need global cooperation to, to make this work. I think, it's, I think it's a big challenge and TB, is, TB I think is reasonably unique in terms of how much of a social component there is to the disease and having to think about both the clinicians, the services and the patients as, as individuals whenever we're, whenever we're managing it. Whether, I mean, one of the cautions with BPAL is obviously that it's, it is a three drug regimen. And as you said, if there is bedaquiline resistance at baseline, we certainly in the trial didn't, didn't see any concerning, any concerning um, signal coming out, of, coming out of patients who had baseline resistance, but numbers were small. And also they were treated in the context of a, of a well-funded, well-organized, well-designed clinical trial. I think that, I think, deploying a three drug regimen or even a four drug regimen blindly without proper support and proper diagnostics of baseline resistance into the into programmatic settings into the wider world um, would be would need to be given some serious careful thought before it was taken on and a, a balance of risk versus benefit made quite carefully by those who are in those who are in power yes 
Yes. Th Jessica, would you like to add anything? Thank you so much. I think Connor really covered all of the main talking points. <laughs> um, uh, Connor, thank you so much for being such a part of the team for the trials. Yeah, my pleasure. Thanks, thanks very much, Jessica, for, for joining us. Yes, and many thanks, Dr. Connor Tewitt and uh, Jessica Wicks for being here with us today. And let us remind ourselves once again that TB anywhere is TB everywhere, as it is an airborne disease, most of it, the pulmonary part of it. So we all have to work unitedly for a TB-free world by 2030 as envisaged in the Sustainable Development Goals. And maybe uh, that promise of countries will spur us towards a judicious use of all these novel treatments which are coming up thanks to organizations like TB Alliance and thanks to scientists like Dr. Tweed and the others. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Stay safe and stay healthy.